I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, it's a War Stories episode. Great radio engineering stories from the trenches. Chris Tarr is here, and our guest Dana Popolo joins us on This Week in Radio Tech, next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 120, recorded March 14th, 2012. Can you repair these tubes? This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Omnia Audio and the hugely popular Omnia One processor. Get your free five-band upgrade today at OmniaAudio.com. Hi there. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, and so glad that you are with us. Thank you for joining us. It's our 120th show, and it uh, turns out it's our 100th show on the Twit Network. The first 20 shows that we did after after Leo in a in, in a personal luncheon with Leo, Leo said, Kirk, I think you can do this thing. I think you should go for it. Well, that's all I needed. Leo Laporte says he thinks it's a good idea. And, uh, sometimes is. So uh, we started out this little show as an audio-only podcast back 120 episodes ago, a little over two years ago. And uh, here we are up to episode 120, with, with 100 of them having been uh, done uh, video on the uh, Twit Network. So thank you very much to Leo and also to Burke McQuinn and, and uh, uh, Lisa and uh, to um, uh, Eileen Rivera and others who have helped to you know prod this show along and make it possible. And also a big Howdy-do, and thank you to one of my uh, co-hosts, the, the only one that's the only regular that's with me tonight, mm-hmm. and that is uh, Chris Tarr from Muckwanago, Wisconsin. Hey, Chris, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm glad to be here. I had to take a couple of weeks off there. I was a little sick with uh, uh, my, my voice actually was was gone with bronchitis last week or the week before, so I uh, finally started to come back, so I'm, I'm glad to be here. I kind of missed... Uh, Miss being around, so I'm, I'm I'm glad to be back. I'm the director of engineering for Intercom Stations in Madison and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and also uh, run uh, the website uh, broadcastengineering.info and a whole bunch of other things. All right, broad. I have to write that down. Broadcastengineering.info. All right. I want to remind people about that at the end, end of the show, too. Be sure we do that. So, uh, Chris Tarr, thanks for being with us. You've been a regular co-host since, I guess, since the very beginning, right? Since the first episode? Yeah. In fact, I remember the phone call that I got from you before the show started, and uh, yeah. you were looking for co-hosts. And, you and uh, you know, just out of the blue, you know, I had talked to you for a while. You say, hey, Chris, uh, I'm looking at this new show. Are you familiar with, with uh, Twit? And I said, oh, absolutely. Who doesn't know about that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm putting together a show, and I think you might be a, a good candidate for a co-host. And after I thought maybe you were crazy, I went, heck, <laughs> anything like that, I'm, I'm down for that. So the uh, rest is pretty much history, you know. <laughs> Well, I, you know, Krista, in all, in all seriousness, I remember you being an animated character. And the day that you and I first met years ago was on September 11th of 2001. I mean, the, the yes. famous day. Yeah. Uh, I was working for, for Telos, which I, I still do. That's my employer. And I was specifically uh, working with the Omnia division. I was showing people Omnia processors. And I, I was in Chicago that, that week. And that morning, uh, that fateful morning when the planes uh, were rammed into the, the World Trade Center, and the other places too. Uh, you know, I think after we, I was in the hotel room, watched it all, got over the shock about 11 o'clock, 11.30, I thought, well, I guess I'll just see what I can make of today. And yeah. so uh, somehow I got, my phone worked and I called you up, Chris, Kirk, yeah, how you doing? I said, wow, what's going on? And uh, I said, uh, yeah, I, mean, I remember it was, uh, it was actually pretty interesting. Uh, uh, we had actually, I think I had a late afternoon lunch and it was, you know, obviously pretty somber. And, and you know, we we're talking about, you know, we didn't actually didn't talk a lot of shop that day. I think we were kind of talking yeah. about the, the current events and everything. But, yeah, I remember that what, very clearly. Let's let's make if, if unless you had a uh, if we got room for it, let's make that a war story because you did a lot of engineering that morning. And I'd like to I'd like to tell the story about that if, if we haven't already or even if we have, it's probably worth sure. retelling. But right now I'm, I'm leaving this guy out. I don't mean to at all. Our guest <laughs> on this show. Is a guy that's full of war stories himself. It is uh, engineer, uh, longtime engineer, and um, uh, just this guy knows everything about broadcasting. Knows so many people. It's Dana Popolo, who is a return guest. Hi, Dana. How are you? 
Hi, how you doing, Kirk and Chris? Uh, I'm doing fine here. Greetings from Philadelphia, where it's beautiful tonight. Well, uh, Dana, you uh, people know you from, I guess, all over the country. You have, have held responsible engineering positions in, in a number of different cities. And actually, yes. I got, uh, well, I, I knew you before this, but I was looking for some interesting guests. And I get a regular newsletter from somebody who we both know, Jerry, I hope I say his name right, Jerry Del Caliano. Is that how you say his name? Yes. That's correct. And, you know, Jerry is one heck of a writer and knows so much about the broadcast uh, industry. Uh, he's a real insider, and it t takes a lot of guesses, I think, at what's going on, but oftentimes he's right, way more often than not. And so mm -hmm. I asked Jerry, Jerry, who do you think would make a good guest for my show? And he said, my friend Dana Popolo. I said, I know Dana. I'll give him a call right now. So Yeah, I used to write for Jerry. Jerry had a magazine, oh, maybe a quarter century ago called called Radio Only. And I wrote his tech column every month. Um, it was an interesting time. It it stopped when my first daughter was born. And she's now 28 years old. So that's oh how long ago I stopped writing for Jerry. You mean he was doing radio only 28 years ago? He was doing radio only. He owned uh, he owned a, a daily fax uh, thing called Inside Radio. Oh, yeah. He owned yeah. a magazine called Radio Only. And what happened is, is somehow... He got into an argument with Clear Channel, and they sued him, and he sued them, and they settled, and he was out of radio for a number of years. That's when he went to work at, uh, at USC as a professor. Well, now he's back, and he's doing his seminars, and he's doing his, his little pay uh, internet thing. And Jerry, Jerry has it together. Jerry is a, Jerry is a very smart man. Um, Jerry, uh, Jerry definitely uh, has the instincts, as we would say. And ironically, I found out uh, much later on, he's from Philadelphia. So there's mm. quite a few people here that I know that know him from when he was a program director here. So it was almost like he was surprised to find out I had wound up here at WURD in Philadelphia. Um, he Because it's like, you know, look this guy up and look this guy up and they, they all know Jerry. It's pretty amazing. Uh, what's the name of, of Jerry's, um, oh, Inside Music Media. That's it. That's Inside what I, Music I, Media. That's yeah. correct. Yes. Yeah. If, if, if you want to know Jerry's take on the inside, uh, workings of, of, of radio. And I must say, you know, Jerry can be, can be cynical. Um, yes. but he's, he's very insightful and, uh, um, you know, he, he connects a lot of dots. Some, Sometimes the dots probably don't need to get connected, but, you know, he's he's always looking and he's often right. Uh, it's InsideMusicMedia.com is his website and you can subscribe. It's pay, but you can subscribe to his uh, daily email where, man, and I'll tell you, Jerry is just a heck of a good writer. He, he writes a great writer. He yeah, writes great... teases in such a way that you just, you, oh, man, I got to find out what he's talking about. His, uh, he does a seminar once a year, too, on new media, which is well mm. attended and... Actually, my general manager has gone the past two years. He, he holds it in Phoenix where he lives now. And I had her go last year. And she got so much good information from it that she went again this year. So her and Jerry have become pretty tight um, in terms of, uh, you know, their relationships. And uh, she gets a lot out of his stuff. She gets, of course, you know, as, as a person who goes to the seminar, she gets, you know, to have the daily, uh, you know, to have the daily... I don't know. I wouldn't call it a podcast. More like the Daily Journal that he yeah, writes. Yeah. Um, he she gets that every day, and sometimes she shares it with me, and sometimes she doesn't. But Jerry, I agree. Jerry's a good man, and um, of course, you and I have uh, had a relationship now for quite a while. Um, you know, through uh, Telos and everything, which yeah, you know, one of the better broadcasting companies out there, um, and or equipment companies, I should say, and. Uh, it's it's been fun. I mean, radio's been fun. I mean, I'm sure we we all have a bunch of war stories. I've got some pretty funny ones, and a couple of pretty sad ones too. I won't go into the sad ones tonight, but the funny ones uh, we can share. We're gonna we're gonna jump into those here in just a minute. I want to uh, remind our our viewers and listeners. Uh, hey, thanks for being with us. The chat room is is alive and well. If uh, you're listening live or watching live, you're always welcome to jump in at irc.twit.tv. And you don't have to be a super geek to make that work. You just go to the link, and there's a web page there that shows you what's going on in the chat room. Uh, our show is brought to you by uh, this episode. Brought to you by Omnia Audio. 
And uh, we're going to talk about the Omnia One during the commercial break. I'll tell you some interesting new news about the Omnia One. So stay tuned for that. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm, in, we're going to jump right into the, our war stories. And I, I want to, if, if we can, Chris, let's go right back into this thing about uh, September 11th, because this was a really interesting day. We all remember uh, where we were and, and our emotions on that day. And, of course, you know, broadcasters were all shifting gears and trying to get news on, you know, wall-to-wall news. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I was in Chicago, of course, which, you know, stations there are very capable of going wall-to-wall news pretty quickly. You, as I recall, Chris, were working for a, um, a, a medium-sized group of stations. Uh, what town was that? Was that in Joliet or... Where was that? I was in Joliet. The The company is uh, Next Media. They still own the stations. And they had a ring of 12 radio stations in suburban Chicago that kind of formed a ring around Chicago. <laughs> and as you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the Chicago stations obviously were fully staffed. And they were all set to go and were able to go uh, live wall to wall. Obviously, with smaller stations, that wasn't necessarily the case. We weren't fully staffed. And so we kind of made the decision early on uh, when I got in in the morning they were going to try to consolidate our resources. And the way we we're going to do that is we decided we were going to have one uh, main studio with one set of reporters that was going to simulcast on all of the stations. And then we would take the announcers and reporters and, and the resources from the other stations, and they would go out in the field and, and do their reporting and, and do the research and kind of present it to the anchors. Mm-hmm. Well, the job, the job was getting those 12 stations linked together, uh, which was not... Uh, a real easy undertaking, especially when you have zero notice. Uh, you know, I literally had about a half an hour notice that we we're going to do this, and I had to put something together. Um, so, you know, uh, the easiest thing to do is you look at, okay, what, you know, who has what? And at that time, uh, fortunately in Joliet, uh, we had uh, the rights to the Chicagoland Speedway. So I had already built a part of a network for that with our stations to simulcast the races. So I kind of had some infrastructure there to begin with. So we decided that Joliet was going to, was going to be the hub uh, because mm-hmm. that's where I originated some network programming from. So from there, we, we kind of linked ISDNs and kind of formed this chain with the 12 stations. Uh, but, you know, we had some interesting things happen. Uh, for example, I ran out of uh, feeds because obviously I had a couple of Zephyrs, but I could only feed one station from each channel of the Zephyr. Uh, yeah. So we, we started to run out, and I actually had no more feeds. So what I ended up doing was uh, I had another studio where I had an ISDN line set up, threw another mm-hmm. Zephyr, hooked up an FM tuner to one of our FM stations in the market, fed that into the Zephyr, and then fed that to one of the other stations. So, you know, within about a half an hour or so, we had everybody dialed up, and we got all the, uh, you know, all the, uh, the news on the air. But then it was a matter of, okay, now we had kind of had to backhaul and be able to put these other stations on the Joliet station with live reports and, and, and things like that. So then we set up a whole bunch of uh, uh, Comrex, uh, back, probably back then it was a hotline, uh, yeah. set up a, a network of, of Comrex hotlines to get feeds back. So we essentially created this, this web network of 12 radio stations in the matter of a half an hour to get the information on the air. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that what I I rem, it seems like I I called you and and you said, "Yeah, I think I'm getting this stuff just about wrapped up. Come on down, let's have lunch." And it was it was a, it was a late lunch. So I drove on down to to Joliet and uh, uh met you somewhere, ended up eating at a like a Logan Steakhouse. And 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 you spent a few minutes d- describing to me what you'd been doing all morning just like you did did just now with all these zephyrs and feeds and and, and hotlines going from different stations. Oh, we, you know, try- we we literally had wi- you know, wires and lines running down hallways. Uh, we had, you know, studios repurposed. It was a pretty big undertaking. And, uh, you know, I, in fact, I probably, you know, memory time has, you know, kind of worn out the memories a little bit. But, I mean, there were things like trying to get phone calls out in the air, you know, using our telesystem to uh, intertwine with the other stations to take calls from, from listeners all over the suburbs. So, I mean, there are all these, all these many, many, many things we had to do. And, oh, by the way, you know, in 30 minutes. And, and you know, we, we actually broadcasted around the clock for probably three or four days on that network and uh, really had no issues with it. But it was kind of a testament to radio and to the people in radio that, uh, you know, can still pull things like that off. I mean, that way it was, it was a huge undertaking, something we never thought we'd have to do. I mean, who would have thought back then that we'd have an event of this magnitude that would require getting out information that way? I mean, we just never, it never occurred to us. And of course, after that, most radio stations, including us, 
uh, you know, now have comprehensive plans on, on what to do in those situations. Actually, but, and actually, I want I want to return to to that exact question. That's what I was going to ask you next. But I want to bring Dana in. Uh, Dana, were sure. you engineering for uh, for a broadcaster at that time I on nine eleven? I was. I was director of engineering for Clear Channel in Tucson, Arizona. Now, mm. I was asleep when all this happened, remember, because Arizona stays on Eastern uh, on Standard Time, okay, which means that the, the planes actually hit somewhere around uh, 6.30 in the morning in uh, uh, Tucson time. Yeah. So we were three hours behind. And I received a phone call from, uh, from one of the uh, board operators that said, um, the country station program director would like to join with our AM, which was News Talk there. And I said, why? And he said, you haven't heard, have you? I just woke you up. I said, yeah, the alarm clock was due to go off in about 10 minutes. Yeah. And he said, a plane has hit the Trade Center and the Pentagon. And, like, that will wake you up, like, immediately, a jolt. The first thing you think is, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're wide awake, terrorism. So they wanted to immediately join. So... What I actually had them do was it was a similar kind of lash up. Um, but what we did was uh, we had the LP1 and LP2 stations for Tucson in our building. We had a cluster of uh, five radio stations, two AMs and three FMs. So what we did was we actually, we actually simulcast off the EAS receiver for the AM on, on all the stations. Well, it didn't sound too bad on the other AM. Didn't sound too good on the three FMs, right? Because we were in essence broadcasting an AM station off the air, but it got them on the air, you know, immediately. Because they, I just said, bring this up on your boards. They brought it up. They're simulcasting, and upon that point, I got in the car, threw my clothes on, got in the car, and started driving in. And I got maybe two thirds of the way in, listening to the reports, and that was when the second tower fell. Oh. Um, right on the air. And I mean, my stomach, I mean, I thought I was, I thought I was, I was, it made me nauseous just yeah. listening to the description on the radio. And we got in and we, we, we lashed up a, a connection so we could put the AM studio, you know, on with full quality. And we did, we also ran it for the, for about two days. Um, of course, nowadays, one of the first things we did was, well, uh, we, we simply added the AM station as one of the sources on our, on our air switcher for each radio station. So, cause, you know, because you can, you can switch between the air studio, the production studio, and now you can switch to the AM station. Right. And, uh, it was, uh, it was a, it was a, a, a terrible day, I remember. It was a terrible day. And what's interesting about it is, is my mother in law and father in law had actually stayed with us for about two months and they moved back to their apartment. They flew back. On September 10th, now they live in Secaucus, New Jersey, right across from the Hudson. Yeah. So they they actually could see the smoke, you know, from 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 their from their balcony. I mean, it was sure. just, it was very very you know very very sad for them. I mean, they they kind of wish they'd stayed with us for you know a couple extra days. I'm but, sure they uh, had a longing to be to be back with you after that had happened. We, uh, uh, everybody, are so many people had a longing to be with loved ones on that day. And you know, all I had was Chris Tarr. Well, what's <laughs> interesting about this that I found out much later on was a friend of mine is the is the head engineer on building the new the new Freedom Tower. Yeah, really? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, I went to college with him. Um, he's a power systems engineer, and he was in the building when this happened on 9-11. They had actually, if you recall, um, what, the, what had happened is was the World Trade Center had actually been leased by the Port Authority to another company, a private leasing company. So they owned the rights to lease all the, all the land, all the office space, I should say, and, mm -hmm. and all the buildings there. Now, there's not, there wasn't just two trade towers. There were four or five other smaller buildings there that are still there, that are part of the, the center. And he had been given the choice of staying with them or going and continuing to work for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and become director, deputy director of airports. And he took the airport job. But he was there. He agreed to stay on for eight weeks to train his replacement. Mm -hmm. And him and his replacement were, were in the building when this happened. They were in the North Tower 
when the South Tower fell. Um, and they only got out because they got an axe and they managed to chop their way through a sheetrock wall and then escape uh, through a Borders bookstore that was in the mezzanine of that building. Um, it was very interesting. There's actually, if you go online and search, his name is Alan Reese. And if you go and search for his name, he, he's actually got a, a, a journal that he kept that's posted online through Northeastern University that, that, that shows all this. Um, and he managed to get out. He, he lost over 20 friends, I understand, close wow. friends that worked with him. Um, he was very lucky. Him and one other man managed to get out. The guy he was training uh, managed to get out, like I said, by chopping their way through a wall with a cinder block. You know, cinder block wall with an axe, a fire axe. Yeah. And they escaped. Um, and they they kept running. Um, he actually wound up sleeping on the floor of a uh, of a of a Port Authority building in New Jersey. They managed to make it out through the tunnel. The tunnels, of course, were all shut down and the bridges were shut down. Yeah. But of course he had a Port Authority, you know, he had the credentials to get through. Um and it took him four days to get home. And what was interesting was, is he told me when he got home, um, and it's in there, um, he reached into his coat pocket and he realized that in the coat pocket was the huge key ring with all the keys for the trade towers that he had. And he threw them down the stairs. He said, I won't be needing these anymore. And he threw them down the stairs. And his son, who was at the time nine years old, retrieved them. And I don't know that he does it to this day, but... Alan said he used to sleep with those under his pillow. Um, but it was uh, it was an interesting. It's an interesting if you if you people can go and do a Google search for this, and it's a very interesting account. You know, one man how he survived this because he very easily could have died there, just like a sure. lot of his friends did. Absolutely. But I, I think nine eleven affected every one of us a little differently, and uh, I think. The broadcasters there, I, I lost a friend who was an engineer for Channel 2 there, Bob Patterson. I mean, and I think most of the people, at least from the East, knew somebody that worked there, that died there. Um, but, you know, it also kind of showed how, you know, how we can, we can get together. We can sort of work together to get things done, um, to, to get everything done. And, and if you go to New York now, of course, the new... Uh, the new buildings, you know, almost stopped off. It's got eight or ten floors to go till it hits yep. the hundred and fifth floor. And then there's of course the spire that's going on top, which will be a broadcast antenna. Ah, I was gonna so, ask if, uh, if they were gonna put antennas on that, and then they are, huh? Gonna be a big project. There's a four hundred and sixty foot, I believe, a, a spire that is uh is made of it's made of a dielectric material and you can put antennas inside it. And in yeah. essence is a giant ray dome. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And wow. they have they have tested it. They they actually brought it to dial up a sample of it to dielectric and they, they didn't do a full size test, but they have tested it and they found it to be RF transparent as far as I can tell. And it's going up on top of the building and it will have inside it um anybody who pretty much wants to have an antenna there can have one. And of course it will top off at seventeen hundred and seventy six feet. So it'll be by far the tallest structure in Manhattan. Now, whether people use it is quite another matter, simply because, you know, with digital television, things have changed. The paradigm has changed. It's either there perfectly or it isn't. It's not like you have ghosting or you have a weak signal or snow. You either have a perfect signal or no signal. So, you know, and, and people are, I think, at this point, are pretty much used to what they have, you know, with everything coming off of Empire. So yeah, we don't know. Yeah, yeah. We'll see what happens. We'll see if anybody takes them up on it. You know, all the FMs have pretty much moved back to Empire. And, of course, they have four times square for a backup. So, you know, I think they're set. But um, that's a war story. I guess that's kind of a sad one we started out with. Now, I have a funnier one if you'd like to hear it. Tell you what, let's let I want to wrap up a, a question I had for Chris Tarr and Danny. Sure. You might want to comment on it too, and and then we'll go to the to the funny one, which we could use. Uh, Fair. Chris, I, I it, you you mentioned at the end of your last comment about about what happened on nine eleven for you. Um, 
And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of radio stations, a lot of clusters of stations that did not previously have easy one button or a couple of patch cord capability to simulcast on all the transmitters that they might have. Uh, after 9-11, they, they, they built that in. They made that happen. Uh, I, I know that you know, uh, my little stations in Mississippi, we did that. Um, we, we made it easy to push one or two buttons and bam, we could have one studio transmitting to, to, to everywhere. And of course, if you've got routing switchers, if you're a bigger station that has that kind of thing, probably no big deal to get that done. But, uh, you know, I engineered for a lot of small stations. We never had uh, routing switches, at least none that would, you know, cover the whole facility. They might do a little job or two here or there. So one thing that came out of 9-11 from a broadcast engineering point of view is the ability to easily simulcast all the stations. Did you find that to be true? Chris, absolutely, absolutely, uh, not, and not only that, but you know, f instructions and and kind of uh, uh, an emergency plan. You know, we're, we benefited at Intercom. We benefited, we benefited uh, with, uh, with, with, Katrina with Katrina because our uh, our station was WWL, and obviously that was uh, on through Katrina, and that really made us hypersensitive to that as well. So, I think not only was there quick ways to get stations simulcasted, but also kind of a plan of attack when these things happen. How do you deal with it? How do you you know, how do you put things to not, not only from the engineering standpoint, but also from the staffing standpoint? Who do you call? What do you do? Uh, you know, so I think I think in a lot of ways it was I mean, it was a horrible, horrible tragedy and a horrible thing to have happened. Uh, the, the the positive side for the broadcasting field is I think it made us all really take a hard look at, at how we had things set up and and come up with a better way to do it. All right. Uh, and, and Dana, at your stations in, in Tucson, did you guys make any um, engineering uh, or policy changes after that day? We did. Um, like I said, we had um, we had studio switchers for all the stations where we could uh, where we could take any studio and and basically run it into the you know, we could take the the FM studio. We could put that on the air. We could put the FM production studio on the air or we could bypass studios completely and 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 play out from the audio workstation so if they were uh, if they were if they were running voice tracked they could put that on the air um we just simply added the am station as another input because we had wow. eight inputs on the switcher so we we simply added the am station as another input on all the switchers so all they had to do is go into each go into the the rack room and uh just just select you know the AM station to do that, and they were simulcasting. Um, sure. So, in fact, we actually did a lot of that that morning. It was just you know literally, you know, since everything, of course, was you know bridging inputs, we literally just looped some wire between all the inputs of the switchers, since they were within a rack of each other, and then just connected that across the output of the AM console. Hey, and then switched I, them all on. I I sense a teachable moment coming right here because you were just talking about some things that uh, that as engineers we we became familiar with in in the analog world. There's still plenty of analog wiring out there. Dana, you said bridging inputs, and as a young huh. engineer, I remember trying to figure out what's the difference between a 600 ohm input and a and a high impedance input, a, a bridging input. What does that mean exactly? Why don't you tell us and your audience, uh, our audience, what that means? Uh, what can you do with a bridging input that you can't do with maybe an older fashion 600 ohm input well of course in the olden days everything was transformer inputs and outputs and to get the proper frequency response um you know the the everything had to have a 600 ohm source i mean you had to come out of a, a transformer or a pad that had 600 ohms and you had to go into a 600 ohm load have everything matched mm -hmm. and if you if you couldn't do that then you use what was called a matching pad to go between the two that would match the unequal impedances if you didn't do that, your frequency response and distortion wouldn't be all screwed up. Hmm. Well, now we, and that's what's called a power distribution model. Um, it wasn't, did, wasn't that because we were using transformer outputs and transformer inputs and transformers correct. had to be terminated with their characteristic impedance? Otherwise, the frequency response wouldn't be right on, on that output. So if you had a 600 ohm output, Transformer, you had to terminate that with 600 ohms. Modern circuits, uh, you know, a, a, a modern... Uh, it, electronically driven op amp output maybe it's got a build out resistor uh to protect itself but a modern output doesn't have to be terminated with any given characteristic impedance it's going to have good frequency response almost no matter what you 
terminate it with. Yeah, that's correct. It's going to typically the output impedance, and there, it actually goes back further to. Actually, I think it goes back to to the Bell system that that, that we use six hundred ohm things. It went back to went back to the old telephone circuits, uh, even yeah. dating radio. I mean, that was just the standard that they used. Um, the modern system of voltage distribution works on the fact that the 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 outputs of a very low impedance, typically a hundred ohms or less. Like you said, you can have a couple of fifty ohm build out resistors, but basically you have a hundred ohm a uh, hundred ohm source impedance. And the loads are usually 10K or higher. So you've got a, an output that will drive a 600-ohm load or a 1,000-ohm load, and you can put 10 of these 10K loads across it before you even start to affect the, the quality of it. Yeah. So yeah. That's what you mean by bridging. Anything that's considered that's uh, what we call bridging is anything that's 10 times the, the impedance that the, right. the, the op amp will drive. So I always if the like op to use the amp drive a thousand ohms. Yeah, you can, you know, you can put ten ten thousand ohm ones bridges across it. Wait, really in the chat in, in the chat room it was asked what was special about six hundred ohms, and I'll take a crack at this, and, and you tell me if it's different. Uh, uh, you know, why did the phone companies have characteristic impedance of six hundred ohms on on all their circuits? And my answer would be, well, because that was a convenient size and winding to make a, a an audio transformer. And so on on the uh, on the on your telephone set, there'd be a, a transformer, actually kind of a, a simple hybrid uh, on its input. And and at the phone company, I guess there were transformers there or hybrid outputs uh, there at the phone company. Um, and 600 ohms was just a, it's a convenient size, and it seemed to work, and it and it it was a good compromise between voltage and current. Uh, to get a an audio signal to go a long ways uh, over a pair of unshielded wires uh, that were balanced and have you know reasonable audio show up at, at the other end. Uh, if, if they right. had built the whole system based on five thousand ohms, uh, then you'd have a lot more problems with distributed capacitance, for example, along the wires. But if it had been you know twenty ohms, then you would have had to push a whole lot more current through the system. Uh, to to make it work well, and then you would have a lot more I squared R losses, if my math is correct. That's correct. And also remember, microphones have always been 150 ohms usually. I don't know yeah. where that came from, but the 600 ohm came from. It's a standard that they came up with. If you if you remember, everything's in dB or decibels. Well, the bell actually they dropped one of the L's, but the bell was originally D E C I B E L L, as in uh, the bell system. Yeah. And what they did was they standardized that zero dB is one millivolt across 600 ohm with a, across a 600 ohm load. So that's what uh, that's what one decibel is in terms of power. Um, and of course, you know, you can have plus four, plus eight, whatever, plus ten, and everything seemed to have a different standard at the time. But the the transmitters of of the 60s and 50s required plus ten for 100 percent modulation. The uh, consoles yeah. would only put out plus eight. So okay. you had a mismatch right off the bat. Um, the, the wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, you mean this is just like going to the store and hot dogs come in package of ten and the buns come in package of eight? That's correct. It's the same thing. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yep. It's the beauty of standards. I mean, There's so many of them. It was it was an interesting time. You know, now of course everything's you know pretty much standardized on the on what's called the voltage distribution model, where you yeah. have the low source impedance and the high load impedance. And you could pretty much, you know, throw anything across anything and it all works just fine. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's an improvement. Um, it's, a, it's a big improvement. I mean, transformers are hardly ever used uh, now. They're basically uh, only used, you know, if you've got an outside telephone line. Um, the reason is because is you simply don't want to take an op amp and, and, you know, and present it to the outside world. That uh, Op amps and lightning and voltage surges don't seem to get along too well. Right. But otherwise, it's I mean, you know. I know very few boards that even use transformers anymore, except in the power supply, of course. Hey, Chris Tarr, um, how many decibels does your transformer have? <laughs> oh, 220, 221, whatever it takes. <laughs> whatever it takes, that's right. You know, actually, it's it's good to know some of this um, lore, some of this, you know, these older standards. Because let's say, for example, you need to go do a remote broadcast, um, but it's not so far away that you can't run just a long wire. I'll give you an example. Um, some years ago in oh, Memphis, in, 
some years ago in, in Memphis, Tennessee, we wanted to do a, a live broadcast from the rooftop of our downtown studio building to give a little updates on the fireworks display on the 4th of July. And so the, the program director asked me, hey, could we get a mic run up to the to the roof? And I said, well, we could, but I don't, we don't have one of those little two-watt Marty systems. And our the Marty that we have won't reach to the transmitter site from right here, I don't think, and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, wait a minute. I got a 1,000 feet of uh, Belden wire uh, in, in my office. Um, I wonder if I could just use that. Well, I didn't need a 1,000 feet. I only needed... 250 feet to go up the stairwell or less than that probably but i didn't want to cut my wire either so what i ended up doing was i took this belt this roll of belt and i think it was uh either 8451 or 9451 you know just, uh, a twisted uh stranded shielded pair of wire and i ended up um i i could access both ends of the wire you know one of them was on the inside of the sure. hub so I, I stripped that and put a put an xlr connector probably a male xlr connector there um, I made no, a female there and I put a male on the other. Anyway, I, I ran this up the stairwell to the, to the roof of the building. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that um, we, we had a dynamic mic. It was probably a, uh, an Electro Voice 635, you know, the one that either can work as a hammer or a microphone, whichever you sure. need. And, and, and plugged that in and at the other end, plugged this, this, the other end of this into um, a, an audio processor that I know had a transformer input on it. So we were all good and balanced. The mic has a transformer in it. The audio processor, the mic preamp has a transformer in the front of it. We had perfectly clean audio with a thousand feet of wire and no noticeable loss of high frequencies over that thousand feet. Why? Because we had a 150 ohm um, uh, a path going on there terminated at each end. And it, the, the audio just was happy as could be with, with that, even though it was a thousand feet of, of wire. And, you know, that's the kind of that that's going to work well. That's how phone lines work, basically. Um, and that's uh, correct. In fact, one of the simple things that uh, that's done is there's something called um, a coil equalization that's used with a lot of the phone companies. And all they do is they take a telephone coil and set it up for 600 to 150. So they're actually mm -hmm. driving the line with 150 ohms. And you can actually uh, get flat frequency response up to about 15 kilohertz. And my daughter's joining us here, as you can see. <laughs> uh, flat frequency response up to about uh, 15 kilohertz on about a mile and a half of 24-gauge uh, gauge wire that way. It's one of the simplest ways to equalize through a coil equalization technique like that. That's one of the ways that um, engineers have used um, uh, to, if, if, they have to uh, if they have to get something on the air, you can we've on this show we've talked about these 111c repeat coils these are these mm -hmm. big they're, they're bigger than a coffee cup right yes uh, uh they're made by western electric they're they're valuable now in this day of more and more digital stuff they maybe maybe they're less valuable but they're also harder to come by um but this thing can be wired the the for either 150 ohms or 600 ohms of uh, of impedance on each side, the primary and the secondary side. So what what people tended to do, if you need to run good quality audio over some distance, um, wire the side facing the broadcast equipment for 600 ohms, and wire the side for the long piece of wire for 150 ohms, and do this at both ends of the run. So you have a transformer at one end and a transformer at the other end, and again. The, the long wire is seeing 150 ohms, and then your broadcast gear is 600 ohms. And this works beautifully. It's quiet. Um, uh, it, it frequency response is just, just fine. And, um, um, you know, no fancy electronic circuits involved, and you don't have to pay anybody for – if you can run the wire yourself, you don't have to pay anybody to equalize it for you. It's not necessary. Yeah, it works beautiful. Like we used to do that on college campuses. It worked beautifully on college campuses. Um, it, was, it was the way to go. Um, 111C coils, try and find them on eBay. You'll probably find they sell for around $100 a piece now. They're quite yeah. valuable. Yeah. Um, another trick with those we used to do is like we would replace the output transformers in a lot of the solid state boards with those. Like the, uh, you know, the autogram boards and the, uh, and the Harris boards and the like um, with mm. those uh, repeat coils. And it, it would make them sound quite a bit better. <laughs> I bet it would. I, 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 those things were uh, pretty flat up to about 53 kilohertz, as, as I recall. So they had a nice response. Hey, guys, we're going to take a quick break right now and hear from our, our sponsor. Uh, I want to remind you that you are listening or watching This Week in Radio Tech. It is our 120th episode, and it's our 100th episode 
here on the Twit Network. And so thanks very much to the leadership of Leo Laporte and his crew and also Burke McQuinn, who's been with us for um, most of these shows, uh, uh, producing them back in Petaluma, California. So thanks very much. Um, if you want to um, uh, get our show the easiest way possible, go to the website, go to the twit.tv website and um, go to twit.tv slash twit twit.tv slash twit and you can watch the show there you can download it or the easy thing is you can subscribe to it you can subscribe to it in itunes or any of several rss feeds and have it show up in your your either your inbox or your itunes or whatever your player is just have it show up there automatically uh every week or so and then you can enjoy it uh, and at your leisure if you can't catch us uh, exactly live. All right. Thanks to uh, Omnia Audio for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, I do work for the company, so I, I, I kind of have the inside track on, on what's going on there. I want to mention to you the Omnia One audio processor. This is a very versatile processor because uh, we designed it with several different software loads that you can put into it. Exactly the same hardware, whether you're using this with for AM for FM, for what we call multicasting, and that's what the Twit Network uses. They use our, the multicast software, which is specially designed to process audio to feed a bit rate reduction codec like uh, MP2 or MP3 or AAC um, or APTX. Anything that's going to cut down on the bits, uh, this processor will do it properly for you. And there's also a Studio Pro version of the software, too, that uh, just does good studio-style processing, doesn't do any pre-emphasis or de-emphasis. It just does a, a good job of multiband compression and multiband limiting and, and no clipping. Well, here's the exciting news, the, the thing that, that just we were high-fiving around the, the Telos offices a couple weeks ago. Folks around the world have now purchased over 7,000 of these Omnia One processors. They are everywhere. I mean, at college stations, at community radio stations, and big market stations where they, they just they can't afford to buy maybe an Omnia 11 or an Omnia 9 or, or the high-end or band processors, they're putting in Omnia Ones. The FM version of the Omnia One now is a, is a five-band architecture instead of the original four-band architecture. I want to remind you that if you've got an Omnia One FM processor, and it's the original four-band architecture, you've got a free upgrade coming. You can just go to the support area and the, the downloads area of the, um, the OmniaAudio.com website and download the new five-band software for your Omnia One processor. And that's just for the AM, excuse me, for the FM version of the Omnia One. Uh, it's one rack unit tall. You can access it with a web GUI and play with it that way, which means you can access it from home or from the office, from a good listening point, and play with the processing that way. It's very cool. Check it out on the web, if you would, at omniaaudio.com slash one. That's O-N-E. You can also, by the way, sign up to get uh, our catalog there at the Omnia website. And we'll send you one. And then you can download it in a PDF. And you can put it on your iPad and take it with you wherever you go. All right. Let's uh, move on. We are episode number 120, which means it's a War Stories episode. And uh, I'm joined by Chris Tarr, the uh, chief engineer for Entercom in Milwaukee. There he is. And also Dana Popolo is our guest this week. Dana's been with us once before, and he's got plenty of war stories to tell. Um, let's see. Uh, Dana, you had a happy story to tell us, and I want, you, I want you to pause that for just a second. Sure. Chris Tarr has a tour that he is going to take us on, a magical mystery tour through a transmitter site. Um, I hope Burke has that just about ready to go. Uh, Chris, is there any, any lead up you need to do to this, uh, this tour as we watch it? Or get ready no, to actually, it. I just I went up today uh, to uh, check on the uh, air filters and get the uh, the building kind of opened up for the warm weather. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity to take a couple of minutes and just do a quick uh, a quick tour. What got me thinking about it was uh, I just recently in the past two weeks got all of my stations, the three in Milwaukee and three in Madison, through the alternative inspection program, and uh, so I had to actually go and and uh, take an inspector through all this stuff. And I went, you know, well, I'm here, you know. At the age of iPhone cameras and things, I could probably just videotape something quick while I'm here uh, for tour. So that's what I did. I, I uh, did a quick tour of uh, one of my uh, transmitter sites, and this is what we have for you. Hello there. Welcome to my transmitter site. I'll be taking you on a little tour here of what we've got. We'll uh, kind of pan around here. We're standing pretty much by the front door. We've got some racks over here. We've got... Uh, HD transmitter, analog transmitter. We've got uh, cabinet, workbench. Bench. It is pretty dusty in here. It's about time for me to do my spring cleaning. 
But uh, let's take a quick tour of all the uh, toys we've got here. At this site, I have two paths. I have a main audio path and a backup audio path. What you see at the top is a Mosley digital decoder for an analog STL. And what that is, is that's my backup path. That carries four channels of audio. And the reason I have this set up this way is we have a site uh, not too far from here that's our auxiliary site for two of my FMs. That happens to be less than a degree difference in receive uh, area from where we're at now. So I can use one transmitter to send both uh, uh, to send to both sites. So I actually have two of my uh, FMs here. This is the FM that's at this site, and this is the audio from the other FM, and uh, it actually goes to our back, our auxiliary site as well. At any rate, so we just only actually take the feed off of uh, the one channel. But that's our backup feed. Uh, next is the Tunwall switch, uh, custom made by Steve Tunwall, and uh, this is to switch around our HD and analog transmitters. I'll show you more on that in a minute. Uh, HD radio tuner, the Interplex system. Now this is our main studio to transmitter link. And what this is, this is a T1, and you can take the time slots from a T1, divide it up, and use it for different things. So right now I've got analog audio coming up through here. Also some uh, bandwidth from our WAN for carrying data up, as well as HD programming, and our remote control as well. Below that, the Automat Aztec uh, RDS encoder. Below that, there's the analog receiver for the STL. The uh, output of that actually feeds the digital decoder. So that's sitting right there. Rack number two, up on top, our main audio processor. That's an Optimod 8500. Uh, below that is our mod monitor. As you can see, we're doing the speed limit there, 100%. <laughs> uh, our Burke remote control. Some audio switching. Uh, watt meter for our dummy load. And then below that, uh, this, this box down here, uh, what that does is that switches between shore power and our UPS. And uh, I came about that is one time we had a UPS that powers uh, our remote control and our audio and all that kind of stuff. And it died spectacularly to where it cut off power to all those devices and we went silent. So what this box does is it monitors the power and if for some reason there's no power coming from the UPS, it switches over to shore power to prevent that from happening again. <laughs> all right, next, we've got the uh, NEI box, which is the Nautel exporter for HD. As you can see, it's running along there, runs on Linux. Below that is the digital power meter. This is the uh, watt meter for the uh, power coming out of the combiner, uh, combined digital and analog. The any aux is just a delay box. We only use it for the uh, GPS function. Another UPS, an audio switcher, and uh, Cat5 switching. Below that is a PC. What that PC does is that PC rotates on, uh, I believe we're using Winamp to uh, rotate just songs and, and IDs. And if for some reason the studio goes dead or both transmitter links go down, we can turn that on with this switch right there and that puts that PC on the air and we have programming running from here. All right, this is our uh, HD transmitter. Uh, right now it's running in digital mode at about three kilowatts. Uh, keep in mind with the injector process, 90% of that goes out as heat. So Ooh. it's really 300 watts coming out of the antenna. That's an Autel V10. Over here, the analog transmitter. Uh, the feed to the tower after the injection is 21 and a half kilowatts. Into the injector, transmitter power output is 23 kilowatts. Got that there. What's interesting about the Dontel is it uh, is mode agile, so we can actually run this as our backup transmitter in analog at 10 kilowatts. Oh. However, in order to do that, we have to bypass the injector. If you know anything about high-level combining, you know that uh, as part of the injection process with the HD transmitter, 90% of the power gets wasted as heat. Obviously, you don't want to do that if you're running on a backup analog. So we have the switcher set up to allow us to switch the V10 transmitter around the injector and bypass it and connect it directly to the antenna above, which then gives us a full 10 kilowatts out of the antenna in backup mode, which is nice. So all of that is actually suspended from the ceiling you can see it took us almost a very hot summer to put all this together and get the plumbing put in. But uh, you can see the result uh, works pretty well. We've got that, and then all we need to do is with remote control, we hit one button, and the transmitter switches modes and power, the antenna switches switch, and boom, you're ready to go on as a backup in analog mode. And you can see there the uh, HVAC system we put in, the hood and everything for the exhaust, and same thing over there with the transmitter there. 
So there you go. In a nutshell, that's the uh, that's it. Outside, I'll let this focus a little bit. You can see you got a whole solar panel field out there. Uh, unfortunately, the one thing they didn't think of when they put those in is ice falling off the tower. So whoo, there are a few of those panels that are uh, smashed up. Uh, then right behind us is a thousand, uh, a little over a thousand foot tower. We're almost at the thousand foot mark with a uh, four bay half wave spaced uh, antenna system. So there you go. One last look. We'll back out. We'll pan around. And now you've got the nickel tour of uh, one of my transmitter sites. Chris, that is cool. The chat room is really reacting to uh, that tour. Nice job. This for the moment thing, I took that with my iPhone, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it worked. It worked fine. Hey, uh, I'm sure I can. I, I had a couple questions in, in mind. Oh, yeah. So the Nautel as a backup. Um, you said it's analog only. Can it operate as analog and digital at the same time at a really reduced power level, or is it really one or the other? Yeah, no, it, it will do. Uh, it, it does run in hybrid mode. It will run analog and digital. I, but I believe the uh, the maximum power is uh, six kilowatts analog with digital. So we'd much rather just go the full ten, uh, 10 kilowatts in analog when we're running in that mode. Ah, okay, okay. Um, people were asking about the Burke remote control. Um, and Burke is a, is a famous name in, in broadcast radio engineering for remote control systems. And no, there's no E on the end of it like there is for our esteemed uh, producer back in Petaluma. Correct. Now, Burke, yep. uh, Burke is yeah, – there he is. Uh, yeah, Burke is, is kind of a big standard. And, and uh, that – you'll find a lot of those. That, that particular model is called an ARC-16. Uh, Arc and they're very common. You, know, you run into them all over the place. And they're pretty they're, – they're workhorses. They work pretty well. You put them in and leave them and they just go. You know, I, I think that tour that you gave us was probably – that may be the first time on this show that we've ever been able to give um, our, our viewers a look at the at the significant RF plumbing that goes on at a site where, you know, where you have more than one transmitter. Maybe you have more than one antenna. Uh, maybe you have – as you have a, a, an analog transmitter and a digital or analog or combined transmitter. So you've you've got to make way for, for some options here. Plus, maybe uh, you, you had a dummy load there too, right? Sure. Well, we have another site, and I'll, I'll try to do a tour of that one. It's much smaller. Uh, same kind of theory where we have uh, one transitor that does digital plus an analog backup. But in that scenario, I actually have an auxiliary antenna as well. So that requires three coax switches to make all of that work. But uh, in this particular situation where I was doing the tour, uh, we didn't have a lot of space to, to put all that stuff. So as you saw, we had to actually construct a frame and suspend it from the ceiling. And uh, I had uh, it was myself uh, and a couple of en other engineers that uh, did this over a summer. And, and believe me, there's no air conditioning in that room. It was hot uh -huh. in there working. Did, did, did but, you design uh, yeah, that? Um, did you design that switching system yourself? Did you draw it out? Because these switches, you know, they're they're unusual to, for folks that are not in broadcast. Um, they have four ports on them, and in one mode, two of the ports are connected together, and you switch it, and they're connected this way. And so yeah. you got to think about, okay, what am I going to do? What, how many switches do I need to accomplish what I want to do? And to my brain, it's just thoroughly confusing. Now, sure, I've looked at a few systems that were all planned out, and, and they, they had the little diagram showing what goes to what. And you can really do a lot of stuff with these, but it may take several switches to get it done. How did you model this in your head to get it, to get it where you understood what's, what's happening, happening, with, these happening switches? with these switches? It's it's almost if you look at the, uh, at the actual the front of the switch uh, that Burke had up a, a minute ago, that's almost exactly the diagram that I drew out to kind of put it in my head. And yeah. Steve Tudwell is great; he builds these custom, and so I gave him the specifications and told him what the switches were supposed to do, and then he programmed the controller and, and built it on his own. So you can kind of see there as as he's moving the the curves of the mouse around, uh, you know the the four uh, yellow LEDs in the center; those are the uh, ports on the switches. And so yeah. all we're doing is we're just routing the RF either in or out of an injector and in or out of the antenna. Uh, so, you know, it does take a little bit of you, you kind of really have to sit back and, and think and, and draw it out a few times. And especially, you know, the, 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 the station I have with the three switches and the backup antenna, that requires uh, a whole lot of pre-planning because then you have a whole bunch of combinations. But what we want to be able to do with this is we want to be able to not only bypass the injector, but we want to be able to put the HD transmitter or the main transmitter into the dummy load while the other was running. 
So that's where you really have to get creative and you go, okay, here are the parts that we have. Here's where we want the RF to go. <laughs> How do we set up the switches to do it? And it yeah. does. It takes a little time to plan it all out. But, um, you know, fortunately, that's one of those things I think really well in that mode. So it was pretty easy for me to kind of put all the pieces together to make it work. But it is kind of cool to watch. And, uh, you know, and, and also one thing you don't think about is is with Steve, you, we had to work through them to work all the tallies so that they were right. So we're locking out the appropriate transmitters in the appropriate modes because oh, yeah. you, know, you don't want to have, obviously – a transmitter into something it shouldn't be going into and being able to be turned on. So there's, you know, Steve Tunwell did a fantastic job with the programming because there's a lot of that that has to go on in the controller. You bring well. up a good, a good point is that when, when these switches are transitioning, you want the transmitters off, right? right. So, so, yeah. so these switches, these, they, they all, they, they have positioning switches or, you know, uh, that, that tell what position that the big, this big honking switches in, and there's motors that, that run this back and forth. But you've got, if, if you're going to push a button to um, yellow, if 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 you're going to push a button to uh, switch something, the very first thing that has to happen is transmitter off, right? right? And then the switching takes place. And once everything is checked, that okay, these switches are locked in place where they're supposed to be. Then we can turn transmitters back on again. That's but, that's. Some logic to figure out. And there's even one step further. For example, oh. one of the positions is a dummy load. If the dummy load isn't on, you don't. Uh, the fan for the dummy load isn't on, you don't want a transmitter transmitting into that because it'll quickly overheat and fail. So you want to yeah. have, uh, you know, you want to have the interlock on the fan tied to that as well. So, uh, you know, not only does the switch have to be in the right place, but the fan also has to be on in order for the transmitter connected to it to turn on. So there's a whole lot of logic and, and, and tallies that have to go on there to make all of that working. So, I want to hear uh, 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 Dana's take on this. Dana, I'm sure you've worked at transmitter sites with plenty of those big RF switches. And I think they're fascinating. I've rebuilt a couple of these things. And, man, the, you, can, you can put a lot of sweat into one of those. What, what are your comments, Dana? What, what can you teach us about uh, these big RF switches? Well, they're my connections work. Oh, sir. Bad, bad news, Dana. Your mic is just awful. Not sure what it is. It sounds like uh, Dana, an analog. USB mic. Just unplug it and plug it right back in. It'll start working. Ah, if it's USB, unplug it and plug it back in. Yeah. There you go. Is that any better? It's analog, but we can see it's it. It's much better. Perfect. There right, you go. go. Um, I actually know of one uh, AM station in a uh, major market, a top five market, 50 kilowatt AM, that actually hot switches their phaser um, with a DX50. In other words, I, I discovered this one day when I saw the uh, pattern change on this uh, station and uh, saw a spark in, in the phaser. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> that you could clearly see through the crack in the in the cabinet. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, big bright spark that you yeah. could actually see through the crack in the air crack in the cabinet. And yeah. I was like, whoa. Um, but apparently they never interlocked the uh, the stuff. So, so that'd be that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, I, I, I enjoy doing that kind of work. I actually had a rigger that is no longer with us who did superb uh, RF plumbing. And the reason that he was able to do it so well was that before he became a rigger, he was actually a plumber. So he knew uh, how to work with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you know, he did some beautiful stuff. The stuff I saw from your stuff, Chris, looks pretty good. Looks like you did a really good job there. You should be proud of uh, of your installation. Oh, well, thank Wait. you. Yeah, it was, you know, I, I actually had a good mentor. Uh, that was really my first major project, uh, project uh, uh, doing that kind of uh, that kind of work. And uh, there was three of us. And we, like I said, it took a good part of a summer to get the uh, the HD transmitter in there wired up and the and the plumbing done. But, uh, you know, what he taught me, too, was was being was, you know, how to. Kind of, you know, that whole assembly, how to plan that out in advance, especially when you have to, uh, you know, the switches kind of have to measure out right for the connectors to match out right. And you know, there's a lot of, of planning that goes into doing something like that. And, and you're right. It is. It's it's almost it's almost like an art to get the, uh, you know, to get the RF uh, set up and, and the plumbing uh, just the way it needs to be in a situation like that. And sure. you know, oftentimes I see it done, you know, I see it done really quickly and and. And not very well, you know, and a lot of times instead of using hard line, using, uh, you know, uh, flexible coax or heliax or something like that. And, um, you know, it's just it's nice to see 
And I see a lot of sites like that where they do a fantastic job and it's great to see, you know, something like that. And I'll tell you, you know, the, the maintenance is very little on it. You know, you keep the site clean and, uh, you know, when it's designed well and put together well, it's, uh, you know, the, you really don't have any problems. Yep. Dana, yep, yep. Yes, go ahead. Dana mentioned uh, uh, an interesting word uh, and that was phaser. And uh, we're going to have to have a whole show on RF plumbing and uh, an AM directionals and, and, and phasers. But what Dana was talking about was uh, actually probably a, a phaser cabinet uh, that yes. contains a lot of tuning parts, capacitors, and coils to um, uh, divide up an AM transmitter's output power so that it goes to several towers. And the signal going to each tower, the power going out to each tower is proper is at the proper uh, 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 amplitude and the proper phase with relationship to a reference tower. We ought to cover that in a in a future episode because that there's a whole bunch of plumbing and and uh, electronics and involved uh, there a lot of theory and and practice too um hey guys we're gonna run out of time before too long and i want to make sure we get to dana's happy story uh dana you had a uh, a, a war story that had a, a little uh, happier tone than the 9-11 i did uh, i, I, I do about. um as as i was a contract engineer in the 80s and contract engineers at the time made quite a bit of of their income from doing audio proofs uh, the FCC used to require once a year that a radio station would do a proof of performance, basically measure the frequency response and the distortion and and the uh, at different modulation levels and the AM noise and in the case of FM, the FM noise and all this stuff and for AM, the harmonics. And what you would have to do is actually plug an audio oscillator into the microphone input of a console mm -hmm. and you'd turn off all the compressors so they were in circuit, but no compression was taking place, and running them as amplifiers, and you would you would proof these stations, and it was great because, you know, for the typical FM, people would get four to five hundred dollars, and if there was a problem, of course, you know, you could fix it for them too and make some extra money. Well, that's that's all gone by the wayside. But the story I have involves uh, an, an AM station. There was an AM station in Massachusetts. A little non-directional kilowatt that uh, was was built in the 70s, uh, not the not the best built, not the worst built, kind of in the middle, and uh, the the station was being sold, and the old owner was a friend of mine, and he called me up and he said, Dana, I have to have an audio proof done on this to close the sale. The purchase and sale agreement requires an audio proof. Can you go do one for me? And I said, Sure, we'll go do it together next week. He goes, okay, I bought a whole new set of tubes for the transmitter. We can put those in. We can tune it up, make sure everything's good, and we'll be done. And that's exactly what we did. We went out there. I put all the tubes in the transmitter, retuned the transmitter. He ran the oscillator at the studio. I did all the measurements at the transmitter. Thing flew through the proof. It passed with flying colors, and the station was sold. And I never heard another word from the new owner until one day um, – maybe about two and a half to three years after the sale, I get a call from the owner, the new owner. Now, I haven't heard a thing from him this whole time. He didn't want any proofs done, didn't want any work done, nothing. And he says, Dana, he goes, my station sounds just awful. He says, you can't pick this thing up 10 miles out of town now. It's all distorted. It's weak. Other stations are bleeding over onto it. It's to the point where, you know, clients are like, are canceling schedules because they can't hear the radio station, you know, at their place of business. Mm. Can you help me? And I said, sure. And I drove out. And as I was driving out, sure enough, you know, the station where normally you could get it 30 miles away, you couldn't even tell it was there 30 miles away or 20 miles or even 15 miles. Well, sure enough, I get within 10 miles of the station and I tune it in and it's all weak and all distorted and it sounds just terrible is a, one of the worst sounding AMs I've ever heard. No modulation, complete distortion, and it's very obvious what the problem with this station is. It, the transmitter needs tubes because I know the last time the tubes were probably put in this thing because I probably installed them before I did the proof. So I walk into the station, and, and, I, and, and I stopped at the transmitter on the way, and I looked because he had left the key, and sure enough, I mean, transmitter is putting out about 400 watts, modulating to maybe 30 or 40 percent and just a total mess so i go back to the station and i go into the owner's office and i say it's very obvious what the problem is with your with your transmitter i said you know it needs new tubes 
And this person looks at me with a complete straight face and says to me, well, you're an engineer. Why can't you fix the old ones? <laughs> <laughs> Why can't you fix the old tubes? I was ready to get a hammer. I was going to go out there with a hammer and see what I could do. <laughs> <laughs> now, and, I, and I'm guessing, what kind of tubes did this transmitter have? Were they big glass envelope tubes, like 833s yeah, four, or? Four, 400 A's. Yeah, there was four, a 400 big, A's, okay. Kilowatt, yeah. kilowatt size transmitter, yeah? Correct. Yeah, so so these have a these have a metal base, but that's just the to help kind of hold the pins all together. The tube is, is you know ninety percent glass on the outside. Correct. Yeah, and yeah. they and they will so, last typically eighteen months. You yeah, know, yeah. Mm -hmm. get about eighteen months out of them. So well, you got the gone. Windex and you, you clean up the, the, the glass with the with the Windex, put it back, and there you go, fix the tube. But 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 he said as a and he was totally he 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 was sincere. And I calmly explained to him, you can't do that. I said, the tubes wear out and you have to buy new ones. I said, and, and, and that's the reason why your radio station passed the proof when you bought it, because the former owner bought a whole new set of tubes and we installed them and got the transmitter going. And finally, I actually it was an educational moment because he actually began budgeting every 18 months, a new or, or every year, actually, a new set of tubes. As I said, you have to do this as part of the cost of doing business. And he actually did. Um, and and from that point on, his station sounded fine. But this was an, one of the more interesting stories I had heard. I'd never heard anything like this before. And he was completely honest. He was, this was, this, he was not being facetious. He was dead serious when he said this. Well, I think that's great that you educated him and that he was willing to be educated. Uh, and you would liken uh, tubes to a set of tires on your car. You can't rebuild a set of tires. You, once they wear out, you buy new tires. Correct. Um, Correct. Wow. Wow. Good story and, and good teachable moment. I, I've, I've had, you know, uh, yeah, owners that didn't want to buy tubes and weren't going to buy tubes until they were actually off the air. It didn't matter how, how bad they sounded. Well, wow. this guy was uh, not known for spending money. I mean, years later, <laughs> his coax blew between the uh, transmitter and the tuning, you know, box at the base of the tower. And he called me up on a Saturday night and said, I'm off the air. What can you do? And uh, and we wound up going to Radio Shack right before they closed and buying a 200-foot spool of RG8, a CB mm -hmm. coax, and running that out along the ground, hooking it up to the transmitter. And we actually got it close to making power. And, of course, that will run fine at a kilowatt. But I understand he never called me back after that. And I understand that an engineer friend of mine that, that took over the station after he sold it actually found the coax still in use and still run out in the field behind the transmitter building five yeah. years later. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Guys, we've uh, we've burned up an hour uh, chatting about all these things, and there's still a ton of questions in the in the chat room. I've I've got a little idea for a, a little show after the show, but right now it's time that we actually close the show out by uh, giving away the very last Omnia AXE that I was allocated by the folks at Omnia. I think we've given away close to thirty of them, and uh, we do this by uh, we have a little contest. If you uh, uh, before the show uh, this time about forty minutes before the show start, I tweeted. Uh, from uh, at K Harnack and also at Tort Show uh, on Twitter that the Dana Popolo was going to be our guest and that we we're going to do the, the show coming up pretty soon. Uh, folks retweeted that and that's how you enter to win. And so, uh, Dana, I need a random number between 1 and uh, 17. Let's do 11. 11. 11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. This is a guy that I see every week, um, but he's never won. <laughs> so I, can't, I hope he's going to be glad <laughs> to win. Good. Uh, That's very good. Our, our, our winner, uh, the 11th person in, on my list here, which I think is actually backwards uh, to, to retweet, is um, Bill Meeks. Bill Meeks. You have won <laughs> a license of Omnia AXT. And uh, we, we know Bill. I've even met Bill once in person at the uh, Cracker Barrel just down the street from my house. Uh, Bill is a graphic designer, and um, uh, he does fantastic work with some animation and such. So, uh, Bill, congratulations. I don't, I, maybe now you'll be a broadcaster, Bill. So, uh, Bill Meeks, thanks for retweeting. Appreciate it very, very much. And he, oh, Bill retweeted to 395 followers. So, hey, whether you've Excellent. got three followers or 400, I appreciate you. 
All right. Uh, hey, uh, Dana Popolo, thank you very much for taking uh, an hour, hour and a half now out of uh, your evening and, and being with us. I sure appreciate it very much. You're very welcome. I'll do it anytime. Oh, do, do you know if you're going to be at NAB this year? I'm going to try to be at NAB. It's one of those things where I, I have my, uh, uh, my, my pass. Um, I'm actually going uh, as a result of uh, if I do go, I'll go as a, uh, as a writer. Because yeah. as, as some people know, I actually do, do quite a few reviews for Barry Mishkin's broadcast list. Um, so uh, he's got credentials for me, press credentials. And I have a friend who lives there. So it's going to be a last minute decision, basically. All right. Well, good deal. Well, if you're there, I hope we can uh, connect and have a sandwich or something. Hey, uh, Chris, Chris Tarr, also, thank you for being with us uh, this evening from Muckwanago, Wisconsin. Uh, pleasure as always. I uh, won't be in an AAB this year. I am, however, it looks like I, I will be uh, back in Dayton again this year for the Hamvention. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. What's the date on the Dayton Hamvention? Uh, it's the 20 something of May. I don't, I don't know the exact dates. I, I believe it's 22nd, 23rd, 24th, maybe. But it's at the end of May. I got to check that out. Okay. Because uh, by then, I'll. I, I, by the way, folks, you know, um, a lot of fanfare when Kirk Harnack actually passed his general exam, general amateur license exam uh, at the at the Brick Twit House in Petaluma. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So I and I I've, I've been I've been shopping and shopping and shopping and trying to decide what to buy. I didn't want I didn't want to buy a used pig in a poke as far as an HF uh, a transceiver. So I found a lightly used, almost new uh, ICOM IC seven thousand um, nice. HF. And, yeah, but I it's I got nice it for rate. about yeah five hundred bucks off the off the list price. Hope it works. I think it will. And so I've been I've been collecting uh, here. Let's see. If, oh yeah, you can see it. I, I got my Astron linear um, power supply back here. So that that came in today actually. Um, just getting it warmed up. It's putting out fourteen volts and zero amps right now. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Am I in your way? Yeah. There's the the Astron power supply. Yeah, That's gonna be powering the. Get Pardon? in. Get it together, there, Kirk. So we can uh, we can get on the air and talk to each other. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that to try it out. Well, uh, hey, anyway, thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. And maybe I will be able to see you at uh, Dayton Hamvention. Hey, thank you for uh, watching this week in Radio Tech or listening. Please tell your friends. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. By the way, next week, our guest is scheduled to be Marvin Caesar. Now, you may know that name. He's the guy that uh, that owned uh, and ran Afex, the company that made the uh, the original Oral Exciter and the uh, uh, the mic preamps that had the the big bottom. Um, the, so Afex made a lot of cool products, and I, I guess they still do. But uh, uh, Marvin is no longer at the company. I believe he sold the company, and he's uh, traveling the world. He's going to take an hour out to join us next week on this week in Radio Tech. So also thanks to Omni Audio for sponsoring this show, and uh, thanks a lot to Burke back at Petaluma for switching the show and putting up all the lower thirds and generally uh, producing the whole thing. Appreciate you very much. Got to go. See you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.